and violent path. Tom Burridge, BBC News, in Majengo Slum, Nairobi. Well, with me now in the studio is Dr. Fumio Lanisaki from the African Leadership Centre at King's College here in London. Thanks a lot for talking to us. We've just heard the testimony of this um, young ex-fighter. Uh, how much are the new recruits into these extremist groups motivated by religion as opposed to money? No, absolutely. Well, clearly, uh, religion is a big, uh, if you like, mobilizing factor. But there's a social base that attracts the ideas that are generated, that are produced by the jihadist mm. groups. And it's important to take that social base, as well as the idea and the narratives that drive uh, people to join them into account. More often than not, we focus on the military approaches to it. And I think we have seen all over the continent, all over the world, that the military approaches alone do not produce results. Do you think that then is where the Nigerian and the Kenyan government to a certain extent are not getting it right in their fight against extremism? Yes, I, I think at this moment the only tool in the box very obviously is the military tool. There might be other tools but they're not very obvious to society. We don't find any counter narratives to really draw society, parts of society that may be attracted to uh, the jihadist groups away from the jihadist group, jihadi groups. Nothing at this moment is detaching them from the narratives of those movements or from their command structures. So, and so I think we have to think differently about it. What do you think then that they should be doing outside these uh, military operations to, to counter terror and extremist groups in their countries? I think any message that tells any part of society that they do not belong in that society, that some people do not belong in that society, that others them and treats them like they're not part of the larger grouping is really a wrong message. But at the same time, any message that, that tells those people that they're not part of the larger group in terms of, this, of the social basis and socioeconomic basis is also the wrong message. In northern Nigeria, for example, we know the levels of exclusion that we have in that part of the country, not because not, there's not socioeconomic exclusion in other parts of Nigeria, but in the north in particular. Our attitudes to the lower segments of society, the attitude of their elite, of overall elite to that lower segment, has to change. Okay, Dr. Lohan Saki, stay with us here because we want to just go across the continent to Kenya, uh, where a controversial security bill is going through Parliament in reaction to attacks by Al-Shabaab uh, jihadi group. It, if passed, the authorities will have the right to detain terror suspects for up to one year and tap communications without court consent. Focus on Africa's Lebuti Seko now reports. Yeah, <laughs> Emotions running high in Kenya's parliament as MPs voted for the security bill to go forward to its third and final stage, moving it one step closer to becoming law. But despite it bringing MPs to blows, President Uhuru Kenyatta said he's determined that it goes ahead. The bill would give the president and spy agencies new powers. They include the right to detain terror suspects for a year and allow intelligence agencies to listen in on people without court consent. The opposition says it infringes on basic human rights. Our country is on the verge of being taken back to the dark past that we thought we had put behind us forever. Our freedoms are on the verge of being rolled back and our rights taken away in significant ways. There are also new restrictions on the media. Journalists would have to get police permission before investigating or publishing stories on domestic terrorism and security. The penalty for not doing so? A $56,000 fine, three years in prison, or both. They want to ensure that journalists are not able to report on these matters so that it sanitizes the media, that they, asking police to, to give you consent on what to publish and what not to publish is the darkest form of democracy that anybody can even can intend. In fact, if anything, uh, it appears that those, uh, the terrorists are achieving their, their aims by suffocating our democracy. This new bill comes after a spate of terror attacks in the country carried out by the Somali militant group Al-Shabaab and a promise by the president to take urgent action on security. The bill will now be passed to a committee for amendment before being sent to the president to be signed into law. Lebu Diseko, BBC News. 
Well, Dr. Fumi Olani Sakedi from the Africa Leadership Center at King's College in London is still with us. If the government gets this law, will it make a difference? Uh, to some extent, but it's not going to be sustainable. We have seen how other countries have also had to institute laws that withdraw fundamental freedoms from their citizens. You need a public conversation in which citizens trust the government and the security establishment sufficiently to be able to cede some of their own freedoms uh, without feeling that they're threatened or without fe feeling that there's a measure of impunity that surrounds that. And at this moment, I think Kenya has to have a robust conversation with, it, with its people. So you, you favor more of a conversation and not so much as a, a, a stronger law to fight terror? Uh, you need a stronger law, but it cannot be a stronger law that the government imposes on the people without the people understanding that this has to be. And that stronger law cannot be so absol absolute. It has to be a step-by-step -step case in which citizens do not think that their fundamental rights are being eroded. I think it's important to be very limiting in the way that those laws are imposed. Dr. Olani Sakin, thank you very much. Always really nice to talk to you about these issues. Thank you. Let's take a quick look now at other stories making the headlines.